Week 7 of college football locked and loaded. The Phil Steele Show is back. We've got five games already in the books with Conference USA and the Sun Belt highly featured early in the week. Pair of AAC contests coming up on Thursday. We've got five more games Thursday and Friday. We're going to run through them all. He's Phil Steele on Twitter on X at PhilSteele042. The Unicorn, the author of college football's most comprehensive college football and preview magazine. And then, of course, the lock doctor himself, Trip Hurd at Trip Hurd. I'm at Kyle Chass. Phil, we've got... What? Five games already in the books, right? CUSA and Sun Belt, as I already covered. I was at one of those. It was wild that lived up to the hype. The people of Boone and App State, my goodness, what a scene on Tuesday in Coastal Carolina, walking off on the Mountaineers. Just a wild chain of events as App was scratching and clawing their way back. Got to a point with a fourth and two stand. Got possession inside of five minutes to go, and Coastal could have kicked what could have been the go-ahead field goal. And then the fumble on the long passing play, and Coastal's able to milk it from there. Yeah, wild finish, and... You know, when it, when he fumbled originally, you're watching it from uh, the angle that they had. You thought for sure that ball was going to go out of bounds. But I think they got it correct. And then how about at the end of the game, uh, sliding down at the one-yard line to, to basically end the game and make it an extra point for the win. So uh, what a wild, great game to watch. And, uh, boy, you had to have a lot of fun being there. Yeah, I've, I've heard Boone's wonderful this time of year. Kyle, thanks for the invite. Hey, sorry, this was this was date night, all right? I had a very <laughs> special person I was trying to introduce. The high country it was my first time in Boone myself. Uh, all went flawlessly. I've done a lot of cool things. If you think about it, let's see, Duke Clemson, I've been at, Phil. I'm not trying to make you jealous. I know there's nowhere else you'd <laughs> rather be than in your bunker with all your televisions. But Duke Clemson for me, saw game day. How about the Bears, Phil, getting it done in front of your boy? won a game. My goodness, I need to be at every single game, but that was incredible. And then uh, Tuesday night in Boone was super cool as well. It was a special time. Uh, it's going to be a special game, uh, maybe for the right and wrong reasons, for one of these two teams tonight. It's the Dana Bowl. Dana Holgerson, his former team he's going up against, head coach of Houston. He's 29-23 and 23 in five years in H-Town. He was 61-41 and 41 in eight years at West Virginia. The Mountaineers and Cougarsville are hooking up for the first time ever. Uh, Texas is on deck as well for Houston, so things can get really hairy for the Cougs and Dana Holgerson if they don't take care of business tonight. West Virginia, kind of a surprise, wouldn't you say? Neil Brown has them at 4-1. and one. They're 4-1 and one ATS as well. Now, Phil, when I looked at these two teams, statistically, West Virginia looks to be worse than Houston in most every category, except the rushing game. But again, quality of opponent matters, and Houston has just been so unpredictable. Yeah, and you know, when you look at West Virginia, I think my biggest question on them coming into the year is we know Neil Brown was on the hot seat coming in. And I was concerned that if they opened up something like one and four, which they could have, they were an underdog to Penn State, Texas Tech, TCU, and would have been an underdog to Pitt and a slight favor due to a line move, but could very well have been a dog in four of their first five games that all of a sudden would turn into an Auburn situation where Neil Brown was a dead man walking. The team would quit and not really play for him, and they'd have a bad year. But this has been the opposite, and it's been the good term, uh, four and one. And when I talked to Coach Brown post-spring, he was bullish on their offensive line, bullish on their running backs, and felt they were way underrated. And so far, he's proved that that is correct. And what they do is against high-flying teams like a Houston, likes to throw the football around the yard, uh, they – shrink the clock a little bit, take them out of their game plan, bring in the extra tight end, and it sort of takes the other team out of their mix. Now, Garrett Green's returned to quarterback. He missed some time with injury. He's back and healthy. They've got the defense. They're holding opponents to 40 yards per game below their season average. Houston is allowing their opponents 31 yards per game above their season average. So I just think West Virginia is the better team here. They're fired up because, remember, Holgerson left them. They didn't fire Holgerson. Uh, so West Virginia is still fired up for that. I, I like West Virginia minus the points in this one. All right, Phil, one more game on the Thursday night slate. 7.30 kick in Greenville between East Carolina and SMU. Now, SMU comes in favored in this one, but they haven't covered their last couple of times out. ECU's 1-4 and four overall on the season. Their only covers have been in their one win against Gardner-Webb, and then the only other cover for them all season was back in week one at the Big House. They were a 35-point dog in that one, though. For what it's worth, the last 10 in this series has stayed under seven times, and SMU, who you would think is generally a good over team, right now they're one in four in totals this season. What's your lean between the Ponies and the Pirates? You know, in this one, I'd give a slight lean to the home team. I do think SMU's a better team. They have played better this year. Uh, Preston Stone's done a good job. He's hitting close to 60% with an 11-5 ratio. 
And I had thought Mason Garcia was going to have a very good year for East Carolina, but he's ended up losing a starting job to Alex Flynn, who's actually hitting under 50% of his passes. He's got a 1-5 ratio. The two quarterbacks have combined for a 2-7 ratio this year. So that's bad news for East Carolina. But this is one of those circle the wagon games. They're off a bye. They're at home. If they're going to turn their season around, they got to start here against uh, SMU. Uh, there is some talent at East Carolina. And while Smoo is a very good three and two this year and did, I mean, remember, they were only down by three against Oklahoma in the fourth quarter. Uh, they haven't been blowing teams out like you would have thought. So I, I'm just going to lean slightly with East Carolina plus the points. I, I think it'll be a better game than expected. And East Carolina, by the way, is seven and two against the spread as a home as an American Conference home dog. We might have a preview of the AAC championship game on Friday night between Tulane and Memphis. Fill a pair of four and one teams. Both are coming off. A bye here playing on a Friday night. Memphis 24-14-1 all-time against the Wave. They've alternated wins over the last six years. And if you dig deeper, uh, it, it's home field success more than anything for, for Memphis. Um, especially under Ryan Silverfield since he arrived. What Memphis has been able to do, 19-4 and at Liberty Stadium since Silverfield took over. So they have been you know, nearly unbeatable. Uh, the only loss that each team has featured is against SEC teams. It was Missouri for Memphis and then Ole Miss for Tulane. Um, Tulane seems slightly better on third down, but Memphis, I mean, this is a strong team that statistically has the edge in so many areas. I think this is going to be a fantastic game. It's, it's hard to really pick a winner um, or a side, even with Tulane as the road favorite at four and a half. That makes me lean home dog, especially considering the Memphis success at home of late. Agree with your analysis 100% there, Kyle. Uh, I think it's a toss-up game. Getting four and a half or five in some spots uh, is nice. And the key to Memphis, uh, it's not just under Silverfield. It's overall. You know, since 2017, this team is 39-6 and six at home. And I really started noticing them a few years back when they hosted UCLA. I thought UCLA was going to win that game. Memphis beat them. And ever since then, I've watched Memphis at home, and they just win – at, in the Liberty Bowl, and it doesn't matter who they're playing, they win straight up almost all the time. So I think that's a big factor here. They are playing very well. Seth Hennigan's hitting 67% uh, this year. He's got a 10-5 ratio. He's doing well. Michael Pratt is back for Tulane. Remember, he missed a, a couple of games there. But Pratt's back. I think defensively, you've got to give the edge of Tulane. Uh, offensively, home edge, I'm going to give a slight edge to Memphis. So i got to go with the home dog here. I like Memphis plus the points at home. They are 6-1 and one as a home dog, 39-6 and six straight up since 2017 at home. <clears throat> All right, we've got another Friday night game, Fresno State on the road at Utah State. This line has moved quite a bit. It opened up with Fresno favored by 7. Right now I'm seeing 4.5 wow. as the current line, so it's come down quite a bit. Um, another Utah, Utah State, they've got a streak going of their own right now in the over department. They've hit five in a row coming into this one. Initially, that was kind of my lean, the over here, because Fresno is generally a pretty good over team. I just wonder on the spread part, is this kind of a fishy line? I mean, is it just Fresno State coming off a loss against Wyoming, or is it just tight because this is their you know second week in a row on the road? Yeah, when the line opened up at 7, I definitely liked Utah State in this one. In fact, uh, in my newsletter inside the press box, I had Fresno forecasted to win by 4. So I definitely liked Utah State. Uh, now that the line's getting close to my 4, uh, not so sure because Fresno is off a loss. But I've actually been impressed with Utah State the last two weeks. The Connecticut game was a scrappy one on the road. Uh, they had switched quarterbacks to Hillstead. Uh, Hillstead got injured. Cooper Lega came off the bench and led the comeback win. And last week, they got down to Colorado State 17 nothing early, but I think it was two uh, turnovers set up touchdowns, so it wasn't like Colorado State was dominating. And then Utah State just took over 639 yards offense with Cooper Lega, who was the starting quarterback at the beginning of the year uh, at the helm. He's hitting 69% with a 10-4 ratio, so they've got the explosive offense. They're dangerous at home. Uh, I think Fresno should be very careful here. Uh, I would agree. I think maybe your best bet would be I'll, I'll lean with you, Trip, and go with the over in this one. Reminder, Phil, you can, um, for anybody that wants more content from Phil, go to philsteel.com for more information. Get yourself the magazine. We're 
maybe inching right at that halfway point, I guess we are, of the college football season. But there's still time uh, to get the Phil Steele magazine. Go to philsteel.com for more info. Phil Steele Plus, $99 value. That's the subscription that can make you uh, bet smarter, not harder, much like Phil. Get access to his entire database. Uh, interact with us at CS Now Tweets, any of our individual Twitter handles. Uh, you get a chance at a $99 uh, subscription of that for free. And, Phil, you mentioned inside the press box. Again, final score predictions for every game, computer predictions for all the games, statistical breakdowns. Uh, that's all available as well. Uh, an added package. Go to philsteel.com for more information. Kyle, let's go. To, yes. Let's give away a Phil Steel Plus for sure this week. What okay. does a listener have to do to get a Phil Steel Plus subscription for free? All right, X, Twitter, whatever it is you want to call it in your in your little rightful mind. Uh, find us at CS Now Tweets. Okay, and you've got to get at us at CS Now Tweets and drop a score prediction. Okay, with a hashtag Phil. Give us a game. Give us your pick. Give us a score. Any game off the books. I, I don't know how many games in total we have. This is a heavy bye 54. week. Okay, 54 total games. Give me one of those 54 games at CS Now Tweets. Give me a score prediction with the hashtag Phil. But you got to hit us up at CS Now Tweets. Pick a game, hashtag Phil. We're going to give you a, a subscription to Phil Steel Plus for free, valued at $99. Oh, who so you, gets it, though? Which one person gets it? Phil, we're going to let you decide. We're going to let you oh. decide randomly, okay? We're, we're going to let you randomly decide. We'll get offline. We'll link up. We'll make sure We'll make sure one lucky viewer, uh, listener, somebody that interacts with us is going to get it. With the closest score forecast on the game they projected. Okay. Love it. Okay. Yeah. Let's make sure uh, there's some validity here, and they're not just you know shooting from the hip, and they can <laughs> be game, they can be accurate. One game per per tweeter. Okay. One game per tweeter. Most accurate prediction to one of the 54 games on the docket this weekend. I love it. That's us uh, workshopping on the fly. Uh, we do have one more game on Friday, Phil, uh, of these five games between now and Saturday, and that is Stanford at Colorado. Buffs are favored by 11, 59 is the total, uh, 10.20 Eastern time, 7.20 local at Folsom Field. Uh, Shadur Sanders got back in the wind column, was quick to flash his Rolex uh, to the visiting student section in Tempe. Uh, you know he's been hearing it everywhere Colorado goes. I mean, they talk a big game. People are going to love to throw it back in their faces, and they've had to endure that. Uh, but they were able to end the slide, get back in the win column. Shadur's 16-2 ratio, 2,000 yards, going up against quarterback in Ashton Daniels, Phil. Three touchdowns and two interceptions, 561 yards. Travis Hunter appears to be back. He's been practicing, likely back for Colorado. Uh, Stanford, bad defense. Colorado, great offense. Stanford, though, is off a bye. Could that help them maybe cover the 11 in Boulder this weekend? Yeah, I think talent-wise, you'd, you'd like Colorado, especially if they get Travis Hunter back this week. But uh, I do like the situation for Stanford. Yes, they're on the road, but they're fresh off a bye. They've been alternating quarterbacks Daniels and Lamson all year. We'll see who ends up taking the majority of the snaps here. But they gave uh, Arizona a really good game, only lost by one. And with Colorado, this is the seventh straight game they're playing. And they've had some big, big games this year. And they're also playing on a short week after playing on Saturday. They're playing on Friday. So I think situationally, Stanford has a large edge. And the other thing I look at with Colorado is the one thing I'm really concerned with is the depth. I like the first string talent they have. I worry about the depth. And generally, when you're playing seven straight weeks, the depth catches up to you. So I like Colorado to win the game, but I'll say by 10. So I'll lean with the underdog uh, Stanford in this one, plus the points. Good situation for them. Dion has improved that offense from 281 yards a year ago uh, to 440. That's the fifth largest increase across FBS teams. It'll be the 13th meeting ever between the Stanford Cardinal and the Colorado Buffaloes again after 10 o'clock on Friday night. Let's head to Saturday. Some big, juicy, meaty lines for some of the nation's uh, top teams in Georgia and Michigan. You go down the line, uh, even Ohio State and Florida State a little bit tighter, but we'll start first <laughs> with the top-ranked Bulldogs, who showed up in a big way. Their most complete game of the season at home between the hedges. 51-13 to dismantling of Kentucky. 608 yards of total offense. Phil, on the first 38 plays over the first six possessions against the Wildcats, the Bulldogs had 384 yards uh, and led 34-7 to at halftime. They've won 23 in a row, 35-36 overall, favored by 31, 56 the total at Vanderbilt. Phil, as your magazine indicates... The last time, or the last two times these two teams have played, Vanderbilt has been outscored 117 to nothing, and that comes on the heels of Vanderbilt canceling a game during the COVID year in 2020. Uh, the Bulldogs might come, you know, ready to eat uh, in ways 
where they you know previously hadn't before. That it's going to be more of the same, I think, against the Commodores. Yeah, and had they not canceled that game, Georgia would have tied Florida for the SEC East <clears> title. <throat> as a as since that game got canceled, they ended up a half game back. I don't think Kirby Smart's forgot about that yet. And I'm going to ask you a question, Kyle. What uh, what color is the crowd going to be for this one? Oh, there's going to be a lot of red, maybe smattering of black slightly because that's, you know, a shared color. But I'm, I'm sure Georgia fans are well aware of that. They're going to show out in red more than any other color. Yeah, the last time I saw this game, it was just a sea of red throughout the yeah. entire Vanderbilt. And that's Vanderbilt's problem at home. They generally are at a crowd disadvantage. But if there's one team, they're really at a crowd disadvantage. It's here, Georgia. So generally, you, you give the home team a three-point edge. you got to give Georgia almost a one-and-a-half-point edge here because they feel at home. As we've talked about many, many times, George is much better as an away favorite than a home favorite. Last week was one of the few times I liked Georgia as a home favorite. But now that they're an away favorite, I really like them here. They've got the offense going, and I don't think they're going to want to stop. Remember a couple of years ago, Clemson got off to that real slow start in the season, and all of a sudden they blew everybody out the second half. We may be seeing that with Georgia. They've got the defense to shut down a, a very beatable Vanderbilt offense. Vanderbilt's been down to Ken Seals as the quarterback the last couple of weeks. That could, would, could be trouble against the Georgia defense. And you talked about this potent offense, over 600 yards against Kentucky. What are they going to get against Vanderbilt? To me, the spread's actually cheap. I would have put the number above 35, heading towards 40, getting it at 31 and a half. I like Georgia minus the points. All right, another big line for the number two team in the country to cover this week. Michigan's lane 33 at home against Indiana. Wolverines coming off back-to-back road wins over Nebraska and Minnesota last week. Their defense has only allowed 40 points this entire season. They've just been phenomenal. They're third nationally in yards per game, only giving up 233 yards per game. The offense is clicking right now. We mentioned last week McCarthy was hitting almost 80% of his passes. He he fell back a little bit. Now he's only completing 77% of his passes. That's still pretty good, though. Tom Allen, he made he made the change last week at offensive coordinator, moving to with uh, Rod Carey, replacing Walt Bell. Indiana's coming off a bye here, but unless Allen is just really good buddies with Jim Harbaugh, I don't know if this one's going to stay close, Phil. Yeah, I think if you look at this game on paper, you got to go with Michigan. But there's a couple things I'll, I'll throw out there. And first of all, when you talk about Michigan, you know, their defense has given up two offensive touchdowns in the first 55 minutes of the game. So basically with the starters on the field in six games, they've given up two touchdowns. And one of them came against Minnesota. I think there was 13 seconds left in the half. It was like a 35-yard pass. Minnesota didn't even enter the red zone last week against this defense. They are dynamic. However, they haven't been great as a home favorite this year. They didn't cover any of their four home games earlier. And in game one, what Indiana did is they came out with a little bit different offense. They ran some option. They tried to shrink the clock. They showed a pretty good defense against Ohio State and only lost to the Buckeyes by 20. So this is one of those games where you're, I'd be afraid to go against Michigan, but Indiana might just be the type of team that could keep it under the number. Definitely Michigan wins. Definitely by at least three, four touchdowns, but uh, – I'm going to stay away from this one. Lean a very little bit with the dog plus the points. And by the way, Michigan as a 30 plus favorite is one eight and one against the spread. Wow. Good figure there. This next line is not 30 plus. The spread is not 30 plus for Ohio State, nor is it for Florida State, but it's still gaudy. Uh, Ohio State is given 19 and a half. 49 is the total. The game is at Purdue, Phil, 12 o'clock on Peacock. you got to stream this one solely on Peacock. We remember the last time the Buckeyes, well, if you haven't, let me tell you, the last time the Buckeyes went to West Lafayette, uh, they lost uh, a final of 49-20. to 20. The game was never close. I mean, they were punched in the mouth from the get-go. Uh, that was under the lights, so a little more hostile-like environment, if you can have that, in West Lafayette. The visitors, 2-9 and nine straight up, 4-6-1 and one in the last 11 meetings. A lot of people are talking about Kyle McCord, uh, Phil, and, and yeah, maybe it's underwhelming based on what we've experienced from Ohio State quarterbacks recently and C.J. Stroud and, of course, Justin Fields, but 
you know, he's got eight touchdowns, one pick only. He's completing 65% of his passes. You just got to find Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, eight grabs, 163, and one of those two TDs last week um, as Ohio State corrected a 10 nothing deficit to Maryland. And then Purdue off a one-score loss at Iowa. Injuries are starting to pile up. I, I, like you said, a team like Georgia not forgetting or Kirby Smart not forgetting what Vanderbilt did to them a couple of years ago. I don't think Ohio State's going to forget what happened to them the last time they were in West Lafayette. Yeah, and I think another factor in Ohio State's favor is actually they didn't look good last week. I mean, they may have beaten Maryland by 20 points, but if you're watching the game and it's the middle of the third quarter with Maryland winning this thing 17-10, to 10, Maryland outplayed Ohio State at the line of scrimmage. So I don't think it's a happy Ryan Day who's saying, you know what, let's just get our players healthy. We've got Penn State next week. That's a big game. I think if you're Ryan Day, you're saying we need to play four quarters of football. One of the problems they've had is starting very slow. They started slow against Maryland. They started slow against Notre Dame. They were slow at the start of the season. Kyle McCord's got to get it going early on another motivating factor. If your team's looking past Purdue, as you mentioned, Kyle, bring up the fact the last time we traveled here, they didn't just lose. Purdue was on top of them the whole game, just dominated the game against Ohio State. You know, every sitting uh, Ohio State coach, I think since – 1950, I saw it on the Big Ten Network, don't have the exact stats, but every Ohio State coach has lost at Purdue once in their career. Wow. At least. So <laughs> Ryan Day is not yet. So he's got to bring that to the table and say, hey, I don't want to be the guy that loses here again. So uh, I think you've got the superior team in Ohio State, one that has not played its A game. They have not reached their peak. They need to reach their peak before they play Penn State, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And I think we see it this week. Ohio State fans will travel. They have a good portion of the crowd. And I think Ohio State plays their best game of the season. I like the fact the spread's under 21. And as you mentioned, Purdue's a little banged up. I'll take Ohio State minus the points in this one. Maybe Purdue should call up Lou Holtz for a little bit of you know motivation <laughs> to to get Ryan Day going. Or, or maybe not, because that kind of backfired in a way. But, uh, God, what a... What a sociopath. Like, that guy, uh, man, Ryan Day, he, he's a character. I, I think they'll take care of business, though, Saturday. Trip. All right, let's jump down to Tallahassee. My Seminoles, Florida State, they're favored at home over Syracuse. 17 and a half is the number here. The Syracuse back on the road again. They've been outscored 71 to 21 in their last two games. Now, it was against pretty good competition with Clemson and UNC. Looking at Florida State, they won handily last week over Virginia Tech, but they didn't cover. They had to cover 24. I think they only won by 22. Um, Trey Benson broke off a couple of big plays in that one, so maybe the running game's finally starting to click a little bit. Um, they could really use that to complement what they've got on the outside. I mean, how many teams would trade for that starting wide receiver tandem of Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman on the other side because those guys are lethal. Um, I, I don't know here, Phil, this is kind of a big number. Last year, Florida State was blowing these teams out, but this year they've struggled a little bit, even with the bad teams. They've, they've had a hard time covering. Yeah, and this is another case where, uh, as you've correctly pointed out, Trip. I mean, look at the Boston College game. They jumped out to a big lead against B.C., and all of a sudden, at the end of the game, they're out gained by 100 yards. I think, B didn't BC have the ball at the end of the game, down by yeah. two? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, hopefully, they learned their lesson recently. And uh, the Virginia Tech game was probably another one. They gave up that kick return uh, touchdown to Tootin at the start of the third quarter, made the game a little bit closer, and then they pulled away, but not by enough. Uh, I, Dino Babers, I think, pointed it out correctly this week in one of his press conferences where he said, where's our depth? It left in the transfer portal. And what's happened with Syracuse is they usually get way up for Clemson, like they did last year, and then the lack of depth and the tougher schedule usually weighs in, and they start losing the games in the second half of the year. And I think that's what we're going to see here. This is a depth-shy Syracuse team. The one thing that blew me away with Florida State going over the team uh, with Coach Norvell is the overall depth. I mean, they not only had practically the whole team back from last year, they brought in a bunch of transfers as well. So they, they've got second team, third team. This is a very deep Florida State team. And I think that depth, the situation, the fact they haven't been blowing teams out all way into the factor. Florida State's probably one of my favorite plays of the week. I like the Seminoles this week, minus the points. Uh, they're just as good as Clemson and, and North Carolina, who Syracuse got blown out by the last two weeks. And I think they take care of business in Tallahassee and don't let up this week. Well, I love to hear that. I hope that's the case, Phil. Let's uh, jump over to the SEC. We've got Arkansas on the road in Tuscaloosa taking on number 11, Alabama. 
The Hogs have lost four in a row coming into this one. They're giving up 33 points per game during that skid. They did keep it close last week, though, against Ole Miss. But K.J. Jefferson, he's been sacked 12 times over the last two weeks. And you know Dallas Turner, Chris Braswell, they've got to be licking their chops looking towards Saturday. Yeah, last week I liked A&M over Alabama due to the fact of A&M's defensive front against Bama's offensive front, and that proved true to form. I mean, Bama gave up six sacks. They ran for 23 yards in the game. The key to that game was probably them converting on third and long, what, four times, including yeah. a touchdown. Also, A&M getting in the red zone and not producing. Uh, given the choice, I'd, I'd probably take A&M again. But the one thing I learned about that game is maybe Alabama has righted its ship and it is ready to go. And I think after what they've just survived, the uh, the couple of games where they didn't look good and the fact they already have one loss, I think we're going to see Alabama be downright dominant the rest of the year. And with Arkansas, they are really limping into this. We talked about it in the offseason. Uh, their four-game schedule at LSU, basically at AM, playing them on the road, at Ole Miss, at Alabama, it's taken the toll physically. Uh, they've got five defensive starters questionable for the game. Probably three are at least going to miss it, maybe all five. Uh, they're banged up. K.J. Jefferson has taken a lot of hits. And how about that Alabama defensive front last week? I mean, they were in uh, Texas A&M's backfield the entire game, just uh, harassing the quarterback all game long. I think that happens again here. If I'm Arkansas, uh, I don't get my players any more banged up. I might just rest some of my injured players, get them ready for Mississippi State. Florida, Auburn, FIU, and Missouri, all winnable games. I could still get to a bowl game, even if I lose game number five here. I think I like Arkansas a lot in the second half of the year rather than this tail end game. This is one where I think they're limping in. I'm going to take the tide minus the 21. And keep in mind, I had Arkansas plus the points against Ole Miss and Arkansas plus the points against LSU. But I was very impressed with Alabama's defensive front, and I think they continue this week. Phil, Scott Satterfield and Matt Campbell were both assistants on Tim Beckman's first Toledo team in 2009. Current teams that they lead, Iowa State and Cincinnati, are going to meet. It's homecoming for the Bearcats. First ever time these two teams have squared up against each other. Iowa State is catching five and a half, 45 and a half is the total, 12 o'clock on FS1. Uh, the clones last week, Phil, very impressive. They, they've incrementally got a little bit better each week. And in front of the dancing T-Rexes, just a wild scene in Ames. You had these nude-colored pants, provocative-looking uniforms. I, I loved it with Ames across the logo for Iowa State. It was clean. Um, on the road now for homecoming. And Cincinnati, third in total offense of the Big 12, second in total defense but I, I got to lean Iowa State just off the juju of handing the defending national runner-up a third loss already this year. Like, I'm, I'm feeling what Matt Campbell is cooking as he returns to the state of Ohio. Yeah, you know, there's major question marks with Iowa State at the start of the year due to the suspensions, due to the gambling investigation. Their quarterback, Hunter Deckers, gone. Uh, top running back, gone. Top receiver, gone. They lost a lot. But I like what I've seen out of Rocco Becht. Uh, there's a guy that's improving by the week. He's now become a force at the quarterback position. He's got a 10-5 ratio, hitting 60%. How about the way Sanders and Sama ran the football last week? Even Norton, all three of them were able to run. That offensive line is starting to gel. That's especially a Matt Campbell. And their defense is rather confusing. Keep in mind, this is the first time Satterfield's taken on this Iowa State defense. Now, uh, Cincinnati's got some explosive players, but Emory Jones is a little mistake prone. He's got six interceptions on the year. And uh, this is the type of game where I, I like Iowa State. I think they're the better team. They're coming. They're peaking. And you look at their losses this year. The Iowa game, they lost by seven, but they actually outgained the, the Hawkeyes. The Ohio game, they lost by three. They outgained the Bobcats. And even the Oklahoma game, that was 21-20 in the second quarter. Then all of a sudden, a couple of turnovers did them in a touchdown on the final seconds of the half. And they, they had a bad second half against Oklahoma. But I'd look for Iowa State to go on the road. I like the upset in this one. I'm going to take the uh, Cyclones plus some points to pull the upset. All right, Phil, let's squeeze one more in on that noon window. JMU at home this week against Georgia Southern. The Dukes are 5-0 and on the season. They're hosting a 4-1 and Eagles team. The Eagles come into this one 4-0 and one against the spread. Been a great spread team this year. It's a tight line. JMU by 5.5. The total's 58.5. Do you have a lean here? 
I do not. Uh, I would not go against James Madison, although they've been playing some closer games, closer than expected. You go back to the two-point win over Troy, the one-point win over Virginia, uh, Utah State. They got a late touchdown to pull that one out, 45-38. Blew a big lead, by the way. And even the South Alabama game was probably closer than it should have been. Watching the game, I thought they were clearly a better team at the line of scrimmage, both offense and defensive line. But this Georgia Southern team has looked really good. I mean, they, they beat Coastal Carolina by 10. They went into Ball State and buried them. Uh, they've, they've been blowing teams out. I remember Davis Brin last year when he was at Tulsa. I think it was the fourth week of the season. He was leading the nation in passing. And then he got injured. He wasn't the same after that. Well, he's right up there again. Uh, he does have seven interceptions, but I like the way he's playing. Love the job that Helton's doing with the team. I would not go against James Madison. I would not go against Georgia Southern. The lines, I would, probably would have made the line four, uh, but I, I can see it at five, five and a half, because it's tough to go against James Madison at home. They are a dynamic team. All right, Phil, so you don't feel strongly about either side there. I'm hoping maybe as we go to Mac country, you've got a better feeling about one of these two, but maybe not because this is a high price, I think, for Toledo. 16 and a half on the road at Ball State, 2 o'clock on ESPN+. Plus. The favorite is 9 and 1 straight up, but over those last 10 meetings, just 6 and 4 ATS. Again, the Cardinals catching nearly 17 at home. Toledo 5 and 1, but just 2 and 4 ATS. So everything would point in the direction of stay away unless you're jonesing, jonesing for a heavy underdog at home in Mac play. Yeah, if I had if I had a lean on this game, it would be with Ball State plus the points and the fact that uh, you know, this is one of those circle the wagons games. They're one and five. They can't afford to lose again. But they just haven't been playing good football. Now, last week, granted, they did have a, the yardage edge against Eastern Michigan. Uh, they've switched to Lane Hatcher at the, the quarterback spot, the Arkansas State transfer. Uh, and that's been positive. But they were blown out by Western Michigan, Georgia Southern. But the thing watching Toledo this year, they have not been a good favorite. <laughs> they have had teams where they should have blown them out and they've struggled to get by Massachusetts last week, Western Michigan, Northern Illinois. So while I feel Toledo is the most talented team in the MAC, and they're taking on one of the least talented teams, uh, a slightest to lean to the underdog with Ball State. Like you said, if you want to take a home dog, getting a lot of points. All right, let's head to the 3.30 window on Saturday. The Pac-12 just keeps on giving us some of the best matchups week after week. This week, it's going to be a pair of undefeateds. Meeting in Seattle, number eight, Oregon, on the road at seventh-ranked Washington. The Huskies are a two-and-a-half-point favorite here. The total's on up there, 67-and-a-half. This is the first time in the series that both teams come in ranked in the top ten. You've got college game day there. I think Penix has really gotten a lot of the attention, but don't sleep on Bo Nix. He's completing over 80% of his passes on the season. This might be a good game to just take the over and sit back and watch some points. But another little streak going here, Oregon 5-0 and against the spread to start the year. Yeah, and I actually like the Ducks to uh, pull the upset this week. Uh, as you talked about, Michael Penix gets all the press. But Bo Nix, remember at the end of last year, Bo Nix in those final two games was hobbling around on an ankle. He's not hobbling around this year. Now, they haven't run it very much, only 19 rush attempts. I got a feeling they're going to unleash the running Bo Nix this week. And that goes with the Bo Nix that only has thrown one interception. Michael Penix has two. And as you mentioned, it's hitting 80%. Penix is hitting 75%. Uh, I feel Oregon's got the better run game. Uh, they're averaging seven yards per carry on the ground, 224 yards per game. And remember, we're probably adding Bo Nix's mobility to that as well. And defensively, the edge definitely goes to Oregon. They're allowing 256 yards per game. Meanwhile, Washington's giving up 365 yards per game. Special teams are close. Uh, last week, I liked Texas over Oklahoma, and it didn't work out. But my number one team in my average game grades last week was actually Oklahoma. I should have listened to that. Well, my number one team in the average game grades for the season right now is Oregon. It's a very complete team with the offense, defense, and special teams. So I am going to listen to it this week. I'm going to take the Ducks to pull the upset. Remember, score predictions, okay? The most accurate, you're going to have a chance to get a free subscription to Phil Steel Plus, valued at $99. You got to get on Twitter. You got to get on X, at CS Now Tweets. You can bet on that game or at least bet your luck. Try your luck and predict the final score. The closest one will get a free subscription to 
Phil Steel Plus. That's at CS Now Tweets. Get at us. Throw the hashtag Phil in there to make it even more obvious, more clear. Continue to interact with us. And, and listen, wherever you get your podcast, we appreciate all the listeners. We had our best listenership last week through the podcast, uh, working through some things with video. We're back, baby. We're back this week on the Varsity Channel on YouTube. Follow Trip Heard at Trip Heard, the Lock Doctor, and Phil Steele on Twitter at Phil Steele 042. I'm at Kyle Shass. Uh, Phil, battle for the jeweled shillelagh no i'm jumping ahead pens i got notre dame on my mind okay I am, <laughs> i'm still just furious and, and brimming with fury on, on the way the last couple of weeks have gone but uh we'll get to notre dame we're still in the middle part of the day and it's six ranked penn state favored by 42 against umass 330 on big 10 network 55 and a half is the total fill it, again it's, it's a big number it's a heavy favorite uh is this worth anyone's time penn state's off a bye they got ohio state looming next week I, I think that would make me lean you know don't take penn state here to cover that amount of points because you're going to be more due diligent maybe in, in managing the health of your roster uh penn state five and oh though overall and against the spread <laughs> this year so their perfect ats record is online yeah, and James Franklin has been a friend of the uh, the better this year. You go back and take a look at the uh, West Virginia game. They got a touchdown with seconds left on the clock. And the Northwestern game, a touchdown with seconds left on the clock. Both times could have taken a knee. Hmm, that's very nice <laughs> for uh, Penn State if you're uh, backing them. And here's the one matchup. And first of all, I wouldn't bet this game because, as you mentioned, Penn State has got Ohio State on deck. UMass has put up some points this year. Uh, you know, when you look at them, they've got Fomantius at, at the uh, quarterback spot has come in and done a decent job. They covered against a potent Toledo last week. But you've got the fact Franklin's been covering late. And the second one is the one knock on Penn State this year is the lack of big plays. They haven't been – Singleton hasn't broken off any big plays. Allen hasn't broken off any big plays. The passing game hasn't produced any big plays. So that, that's all James Franklin is hearing. And guess who's last in the NCAA in allowing big plays this year? It's UMass. So I'm looking for big plays from Penn State. That could threaten the 42-point spread. Uh, I'm staying away from it, but look for big plays from Penn State. I think when you're watching the highlight films, we'll see – let's use an over-under of five plays – of uh, 25 or more uh, scoring on this week. All right, Phil, let's jump over to the Big 12, number 23, Kansas. They're a field goal favorite on the road this week at Oklahoma State. The Jayhawks took UCF behind the woodshed last week. They ran for almost 400 yards on the Knights. They didn't give up a score until the third quarter. Um, this is going to be another, what it looks like, a game-time decision for their Normal starter Jalen Daniels at quarterback. Um, on the other side, Phil, you nailed it last week with the Cowboys. They upset K State. You mentioned maybe kind of a new turning point in the season for them. A chance to start over from Mike Gundy and company. Can they keep it rolling this week against Kansas? Yeah, I look for Oklahoma State to have an excellent second half of the year. And and frankly, the big the big change uh, came against Iowa State. They would alternated three quarterbacks the first three games. And uh, finally, Gundy said, you know what? We're going with Alan Bowman, thick or thin. And they put up over 400 yards against a very good Iowa State team. Came back last week with over 400 yards against a very good Kansas State defense. And I think they continue to roll. Meanwhile, I ask you guys, give me a year here. When's the last time Kansas was an away favorite? Oh, that's got to be 2007? Right? Close. 2009. So. Oh been a long time since they've been an away favorite. Jason Bean is a very capable quarterback. I think he's one of the best backup quarterbacks out there. He's run. Last year he ran for over 200 yards. He can run the ball. He can throw the ball. Got all that. We saw it last week with 51 points against UCF, 490 yards. But he's not Jalen Daniels. I don't expect Jalen Daniels to play. And this is an Oklahoma State team that's going to be playing better on offense, defense, special teams the rest of the year. Gundy's got this thing turned around. The rest of the schedule sets up well. Frankly, I'd have Oklahoma State favored in the game. I like the fact they're the underdog. I'll take Oklahoma State plus the three. Phil, Florida and South Carolina. I'm interested where the value might be between uh, two teams that are you know, blah. If I don't know if there's a better way to, to really describe them. I mean, Florida is catching two on the road at South Carolina, 330 on SEC Network. Florida did beat Vanderbilt next week. Cool, cool story. South Carolina lost by, I think, 21 up on Rocky Top. So, you know, the thing with these two, this series has been dominated by Florida, like, all time. Uh, of the of the 10 wins, though, um, of the 10 South Carolina, uh, eight of them uh, have been by Flo 
have been at home, okay? So South Carolina has found their success at least at home against Florida in a series dominated by the Gators. But uh, is there a side that you might like between Florida and South Carolina on Saturday? Yeah, and be honest with you, it's a sight. If the game is in the swamp, I'll take Florida by seven. The game's at South Carolina, I'll take South Carolina by seven. I mean, uh, Florida under Billy Napier has now lost seven of the last eight games on the road. And we saw what they've done on the road so far this year. A couple of very poor performances against Utah and Kentucky. Meanwhile, South Carolina, that's a tough place to go play. Uh, they are 12 and four straight up at home under Beamer, 11 and four, 11 and five against the spread. So I think the two teams are very close. Uh, home field edge, though, is massive. And as you mentioned, it's been massive in this series. South Carolina plays a lot better at home. You've got the better home team against the weaker road team. I got to go with South Carolina, and they're only laying one and a half, so they basically just have to win the game. That's why those straight up records are important in this one. All right, Phil, we've got a four o'clock kick time in Madison between Wisconsin and Iowa. And the Hawkeyes come into this one with some questions at quarterback, you know, Cade McNamara. He's injured. In comes Deacon Hill. He went six for 21 last week against Purdue. Not very impressive. Look, at first glance, the 10 points does look like a lot to cover, but it's hard to trust Iowa coming into the game this week at Camp Randall. I mean, for me, this might just be another good old-fashioned Big Ten under. Yeah, what's the under in this one, trip? 30... 36 and a half. Yeah, it seems like a low total, but for Wisconsin, Iowa, it's not really a low total. Uh, Iowa has an excellent defense. Uh, even last week against Purdue, it's 20 to 7. They did give up a late touchdown, a meaningless touchdown, and it was meaningless. It didn't matter versus the spread, but Coach Ferentz sort of was tongue in cheek after the game about that touchdown they gave up. So really, it is an excellent defense, an excellent special teams. It's tough to go against Iowa and lay that many points any time. Yes, Penn State did win 31 nothing. but Wisconsin's not quite up to Penn State category. But, you know, Wisconsin's got a good D, but their offense hasn't hit on all cylinders this year. So uh, you take a look at this game uh, last year when these two played. It was 24-10, and I think it was fortunate to get the 34 points last year. The year before that, it was 27-7. So I think it stays under the 36. Under would be my favorite play. I like Wisconsin to win the game. But as you mentioned, Tripp, it's tough to lay double digits against Iowa. Let's go to Lane Stadium in Blacksburg, where Wake Forest will take on Virginia Tech. The Hokies are two-point favorite, 330 on ACC Network. Total number is 48. Now, the last time these two teams played in Lane Stadium, as your magazine reminds us, Phil, uh, 2019, it was the first time since 1980 that Wake went to Blacksburg as a favorite, and they got thumped 36-17. to Now, this year has been underwhelming from Wake Forest standards, where they've kind of asserted themselves over the last couple of years. What a sloppy, ugly rock fight of a game at Clemson. A game, again, you just make a couple, just make a couple plays. You know, make a quarter of the plays that you've been accustomed to making when you've played Clemson over the last handful of years, but they couldn't do anything. Clemson couldn't do anything. And now Wake is limping in to a Virginia Tech game, another poor team. And, Phil, Wake only has three wins, and, and I'm looking at the rest of their schedule. I don't think they get bow eligible this year. There's three opponents, and Virginia Tech's one of them. Pitt and Syracuse, the other two. I think you've got to win two of those three for sure, and then a swing game with Duke or NC State, but I'm not seeing it happening. Um, where's the motivation come from for either side in this game? Have to be with the home favorite. Yeah, I think both teams have the motivation and the fact that they need to win or they're probably not going to a bowl game this year. I would think that the loser of this game is going to struggle uh, to get to a bowl game. So I think both teams would be highly motivated. Uh, they're both coming off decent efforts. You know, Wake uh, played a, an extremely talented Clemson team within five. Virginia Tech stayed within the, the number against Florida State, had that thing close in the third quarter. Uh, Tech is tougher at home, no doubt about it. But when they played Pitt the last time, remember Pitt was missing three offensive linemen. Uh, they uh, banged up quarterback, banged up a lot of things for Pitt in that game. Uh, I do think that these two teams are fairly close. I like Lane Stadium. I like the home crowd. If it was at night, I'd probably like them even a little bit more because that's a tough place to play with Ender Sandman. But uh, I'm going to lean with Virginia Tech minus the points at home in this one. I, I think it would be a very good game, and we're going to learn a lot about both these teams for the rest of the season. All right, over to the Big 12. BYU on the road at TCU. The Horn Frogs favored by five and a half. 
Uh, BYU's coming in four and one overall against a TCU team that's 500, three and three. These two haven't met since 2011. TCU won that game 38 to 28. The big news in this game for TCU is they're going to have a new quarterback starting, Josh Hoover. He'll be making the first start after Chandler Morris had to leave last week against Iowa State. He had a rough start in the first couple of uh, series for um, Hoover last week but he did settle down a bit after those first two series he had i mean it was kind of crazy i think they fumbled a snap and he had to dive on it and then he threw a pick in the next series but he he looked a little better towards the end of the game so what do you like here between byu and tcu you know it, it was interesting uh when i was going over the team post spring with uh coach dykes and we were talking about the quarterback position he wrapped it up this way he said phil I feel really good about our quarterback position. No matter who wins the job, I think they're going to have a very good year. That has me thinking he's got a lot of confidence in Josh Hoover. So uh, I think that Hoover, with a full week of working with the first team, expecting to play, will have a much better game. And I'm not concerned about the quarterback position right now because Coach wasn't concerned about the quarterback position post-spring. They do have Imani Bailey running the football well. Uh, they've got an underrated defense, I feel, uh, that's uh, better than what they showed against Colorado, and they've been playing better down the stretch, and they're tough at home. Plus, they're in a must-win situation here. They can't fall to three and four with Kansas State, Texas Tech on deck. Meanwhile, BYU, i still scratching my head how this team is winning football games. I mean, they were minus 143 yards against Arkansas, minus 203 yards against Cincinnati, won both games. They do not run the football. They averaged 63 yards on the ground, 2.3 yards per carry. In their last two games, they're giving up almost six yards per carry, so they're not a very good team. Keaton Slovis, if you're putting the onus on him to win the game on the road, I'd be careful. I've watched Keaton Slovis the last couple of years, so overall, uh, I'm surprised the number didn't go down on the announcement that Chandler Morris was out. It was like five, five and a half. It's actually six right now. But I like TCU minus the points at home in this one. Phil, Troy and Army, final one of the afternoon slate of games that we want to spotlight. 3.30 CBS Sports Network. Troy is giving the Black Knights four and a half, 45 is the total. Now, these two teams met for the first time ever last year. Final score, 10-9 out in Troy. Um, Trip, do you have that? total in front of you right now because I'm not seeing it on the dock I would be very curious what the over under is for Troy and Army again 10-9 game a year ago Troy comes in favored on the road first ever trip to West Point I don't know what to make to this one of of this one Phil but it, it seems plenty of fun you got that number trip 40 42 and a half is oh, what God. I see under, right now under <laughs> Uh, yeah, this one I, I don't really have much of an opinion on because Army uh, played well last week against Boston College. I expected Boston College to win the game. Uh, as it was, Boston College needed a touchdown in the final seconds to pull that one out. In fact, had Army not had a touchdown called back on a legal forward pass, uh, they would have had a two-score lead in that. They were outgained by Boston College, 390 to 266. Meanwhile, Troy, uh, uber impressive the last two weeks. I love what they did at Georgia State. I mean, that was a very good Georgia State team. It was red hot. They went in and put 410 yards offense on Georgia State, came out with a win. They're playing much better ball. Gunnar Watson now a 10-4 ratio. And the thing that uh, when I was talking to uh, Coach Sumrall after the uh, spring was over, he had mentioned that last year they relied on the defense. Pretty much they didn't take a lot of chances with the offense. This year they are going to take a lot more chances with the offense. And we've seen their offense be more potent, whereas last year, they had just 360 yards per game. They're up to 444 yards per game this year. So uh, I, I think Troy wins the game, but uh, to me the spread's accurate where it is. I'm just going to watch and learn on this one. All right, Phil, you had an interesting thought on USC as we head to the evening slate, and it's going to be highlighted uh, by number 10 USC and number 21 Notre Dame, Notre Dame Stadium, 730 NBC uh, and Peacock, the battle for the jeweled shillelagh. I need, I need some optimism, Phil, but when you were on with Stephen Hartzell and Wayne Cook earlier this week talking about USC, look, the defense wasn't as bad as what a lot of people want to make USC out to be following that overtime, three-overtime thriller where they escape by the skin of their chinny-chin-chin chin against the Wildcats last week. And, and again, because of Caleb Williams, who wasn't even his best, but making something out of nothing. What was it, only 28 points in, in regulation, Phil, that USC had given up? I think, though, 
as poor as USC has played defensively, this is the recipe for Notre Dame to maybe get right because their offense has been abysmal over the last three weeks since they've stepped up in weight class. They're at home. They're a home favorite by a slight margin. They're reeling. They're not going to make it to the playoff at this point, but it's Notre Dame. They're not going to just lay down. This is a massive arch rival uh, type opportunity. And Sam Hartman, 14 TDs, zero interceptions, entering the game at Louisville. What happened? Three interceptions. So um, I think they're going to find a way somehow to get this train back on the tracks. I'm, I'm hoping you share the same optimism. Yeah, and you hit it right on the head, Kyle, And the fact that uh, last week, I, I, all I hear is people saying the USC gave up 40 points to Arizona. They actually gave up 28 in regulation, and, and the rest were overtime points, which I don't count. I, I, in my mind, I don't count overtime points. So really had USC, as you remember, they flubbed the uh, the snap on the, the game-winning field goal. They could have won that game 31-28 last year, and I don't think last week I don't think people would be as down on their defense. However, they did allow 506 yards. Uh, on the season, they're giving up 4.2 yards per carry, so those are trouble. I did like the way Bear Alexander starting to play at the defensive line spot for USC. He may be able to clog the middle up a little bit better than what they've been doing. I look for the emergence of Bear Alexander down the stretch. However, as tough as it is to go against Caleb Williams, I think Sam Hartman, last time I checked, I don't think USC is going to be wearing Louisville uniforms, and Sam Hartman has trouble throwing against Louisville. I mean, he said, what, three and four interceptions the last two years. I think it will see Sam Sam Hartman now back at home. Ironically, this is the fourth straight unbeaten ranked team that Notre Dame has played. How about that? Unbeaten and ranked Ohio State, unbeaten and ranked Duke, unbeaten and ranked Louisville, and now unbeaten and ranked USC. Almost, uh, uh, I mean, narrowly uh, unbeaten USC. But I think the home edge is big. The home field is uh, eight and one straight up and against the spread in this series, as you would expect. Two completely different climates, uh, two very rabid home crowds. So add it all up, I think the better defense, better special teams, and a Sam Hartman returning to form this week. I like Notre Dame to win this one at home. Love it. All right, Kyle, we always talk about picks at the end of the show. Here's my pick. I'm taking North Carolina minus three and a half. They're at home. Taking on Miami, and you talk about flubbing. How about Mario Cristobal last week? We all know what happened at the end of that game. But UNC is the story here. They've looked great the last couple of weeks. I think the Hills are the better team. I think they're at home. But, I mean, is it, it's just one of those situations. Can Miami bounce back from what happened last week against Georgia Tech? Or do we just kind of see what was a promising season unravel for the Hurricanes? Yeah, I I – think that we're going to see Miami bounce back. They should play better football. I can't imagine they're going to get beat twice by the, the same play. And if you go back to that game last week, as close as it was, and I know uh, I've heard some commentary saying, you know, they were completely outplayed in the game by Georgia Tech, barely won. Heck, prior to that final drive, which Georgia Tech shouldn't have had, had they taken a knee, Miami would have had a 453 to 175 yard edge. I mean, Van Dyke didn't play well. They had minus three turnovers. Uh, they held Georgia Tech to basically 11 first downs. They had 23. So Miami is strong at the line of scrimmage. I like North Carolina. I like them a lot. Last week, I liked them a lot against Syracuse, and they won big for me. Uh, they're playing defense. They're running the football, two things they didn't do last year. So it's tough to go into North Carolina and do that. But this is a very good Miami team that's strong at the line of scrimmage, and they've got Tyler Van Dyke. I expect to return to form. So I'm going to stay away from this one. I'll cede this one to you, Tripp. Tripp's pick is North Carolina, and uh, we'll let him pick this game. All right, Tripp, you are you are helping to influence uh, the master himself, the godfather, Phil Steele. Follow my next at Phil Steele 042. Again, more information about Phil Steele Plus at philsteele.com. Interact with us at CS Now Tweets. Give us a score prediction. Hashtag Phil. Get at us at CS Now Tweets. Closest, most accurate prediction from week seven. We'll get a free subscription of Phil Steele Plus, valued at 99 bucks. Those Louisville Cardinals ranked 14th now, Phil. Uh, one of just three ACC unbeatens, if I recall correctly, favored by more than a touchdown. Seven in the hook at Pitt, 630 on the CW. I don't want to spend much time on Pitt. They've, they've disappointed me uh, very early on and often, and uh, you know they're dead to me at this point. And for now, I've, I've become, because Louisville took down Notre Dame in the fashion they did last week, um, they do have Duke coming up, which you know I can get a little sensitive, emotional uh, to that because of some connections there. But uh, I'm a fan of Louisville. I'm a fan of Jeff Brom and everything he's doing, everything he's preaching, whatever they're putting in the water. I mean, this guy is off to the best start in close to 100 years. Only two coaches have, have had this kind of success in Louisville football program history, and he's one of them. So 45 and a half the total. 
Pitt, though, can get a little weird at night, maybe, if the fans decide to show up and, and Pitt puts their best foot forward. What do you think of Louisville and Pitt here on Saturday night? Yeah, and this is one of those games where uh, I'm going to go out of the box. And uh, I think it's a situational game is great for Pitt. Uh, you talk about, remember we talked about Oklahoma State. They needed to get the things right over the bye, come out of the bye at home, charge up. They beat Kansas State. Pitt had to get things right. Now, Phil Jerkovic is now playing tight end. We'll see how Christian Valu does at the uh, the quarterback spot. But their defense isn't playing bad. They've actually had held four of their five opponents to season lows. They're only allowing 302 yards per game. If they get adequate quarterback play and don't turn the ball over, they're catching Louisville off a big, big win, a celebratory win. Everybody's patting them on the back. They're in rare air at 6-0 and and having to travel. And believe it or not, Louisville games, I believe it's been um, – 12 straight Louisville games that the home team has covered. So the, the you look at the fact they only beat Georgia Tech earlier in the year by five. Indiana was at their one-yard line at the end of the game, down by seven. They only beat NC State by three. As bad as Pitt has looked this year, I'm going to pick uh, Pitt plus the points over Louisville. All right, I know we're running out of time here, so I'll go quickly. We've got Wyoming at Air Force. Air Force minus 10 and a half in this one. They're undefeated. They're 5 and 0 on the season. They're back at home, but isn't this the same Wyoming team that upset Fresno last week? It just seems like a lot of points for the Falcons to cover here, Phil. Yeah, I agree. And since we're running out of time, I'll try to shorten it up. With Wyoming, uh, the one thing is Craig Bull, since 2014, this guy knows how to defend the option. Uh, last three years, they have held Air Force to practically their season lows, generally under 100 to 125 yards under their season average every time they play. This is the same Wyoming team that went into Texas and was tied 10-10 in the fourth quarter. They've developed the run game. They've got the quarterback playing. They know how to defend the option. I'll take Wyoming plus the big points here. All right, and one more game we've got to jump in here. Another good one in the Pac-12. Number 18, UCLA will be on the road at 15th-ranked Oregon State. The Beavers laying three and a half at home. Third consecutive top 15 team that UCLA is going up against here. They've only given up one offensive touchdown in the last two weeks combined, and they were playing Utah and Washington State. We know what a great offensive team the Cougs are. UCLA defense has just been outstanding. They only gave up 216 yards to Cam Ward. I mean, that's really impressive. Now, on the other end, Oregon State, they got five touchdowns from DJ last week against Cal. So maybe we trust him and that quarterback position just a little bit more than Dante Moore. I mean, Dante Moore has been explosive, but he's thrown some, he's he's made some bad decisions down there in the red zone this year. Who do you like in this one, Phil? Yeah, if the game's in Reeser Stadium, I like the Beavers. 15-1 and one straight up and against the spread at home. Now, UCLA is number one in the country in yards per play allowed. So that is a legitimate defense. However, they went into Utah and lost by seven, a game they trailed 14 to seven. Oregon State hosted that same Utah team, led 21 nothing, ended up winning 21 seven. I think the home field is huge here. Reeser Stadium, I'm taking the Beavers minus three and a half. All right, Phil, All right. late night desperation. Trip will follow with Boise State, Colorado State. I want your thought on San Diego State and Hawaii, though. The Aztecs favored by six. This is just a gross game. 11 o'clock, CBS Sports Network. You got a side here? Yeah, I do. Uh, when you look at San Diego State, the one thing I want you to look at is who they have played so far this year. Uh, they opened the season taking on the best team in the MAC in Ohio. They took on UCLA, who we just talked about. They took on Oregon State in Reeser Stadium, who we talked about. They took on the best team in the Mountain West in Boise State. They took on Air Force, an undefeated Air Force on the road. And now they're taking on who? Hawaii. This is the strength of schedule game of the year for me. They go from taking on massive, hard, top-notch teams to taking a winnable game. I look for San Diego State to vent a lot of frustration. I look for San Diego State to play a lot better football down the stretch this year. All right, Phil, one last game to mention here. Boise State at Colorado State, 945 kick time on FS1. Boise favored by 7.5 here. I'm a little more interested in the total sitting at 61. Both these teams come in a combined 9-2 and two on overs this year. and in, in the series, it's gone over 7 out of the last 10. What's your lean on this game? I'd go with the over. Uh, Braden Fowles, Nichols, Nichols he, uh, is having a great year for Colorado State. Uh, he's got 11 touchdowns, but he also has 10 interceptions. 
So if you're playing Colorado State here, you're concerned about the interceptions, but sometimes interceptions lead to points. Touchdowns lead to points. Boise's got a potent offense uh, going against a defense that can give up uh, points. So, yeah, I would lean with the over in this one. would be my favorite play there. All right, 60 minutes of jam-packed knowledge that we have uh, injected in all of our listeners' and viewers' brains. Let's summarize quickly your favorite plays, Phil, your power plays for Week 7 in college football. You know, let's go with a, a larger dog in Wyoming. And then two big favorites. Uh, I look for Ohio State and Georgia to both uh, flex their muscles this week. I personally am going to take Notre Dame for all the wrong reasons because I'm, I'm leaning with my heart. But a home favorite uh, by two and a half to cover against USC. Iowa, the 10 points is just too big, Phil. It's just too big for me. Come on, the Hawkeyes going to Wisconsin. They cover the 10. They find a way. Defensive scores, special teams. It's not going to happen with their offense. I know that. But 10 is just too much. Also, a, a little weird play in the Mountain West. UNLV, who is 5-0 and ATS this year, covering just 9.5. Not even double digits on the road at Nevada. People might be thinking, about that Kansas result a little too much with the Wolfpack. So UNLV, Notre Dame, and Iowa all to cover. Uh, Trip, anything else you'd like to add? I'll be adding a couple more on tomorrow's show. We've done our three for all with Hartzell and Michael Felder for a few weeks in a row. Did go three and zero oh last week. That FSU over was my best play on the board. Finally got one to hit. I was due. Good for you, Trip. Uh, nice good job, for you. Trip. I I hope you can keep <laughs> uh, the good times rolling. Uh, here this weekend. We'll be back uh, for week eight. In the meantime, too, find Phil on Twitter and X again at PhilSteel042. Look for those YouTube walkthroughs, those tutorials. Phil Steel Plus, you give um, all of your fans a, a glimpse behind the curtain each and every Friday, right, Phil? Yes, sir. Every Friday. Uh, and then last week was a guaranteed winning week, and we won. So make sure you check it out this week. And don't forget to hit us up on Twitter at, C- at CS, uh, now. CS Now Tweets. CS Now Tweets. Score prediction. Hashtag Phil. Most accurate. We'll get a subscription to Phil Steel Plus. Valued at 99 bucks. More info at PhilSteel.com. There you have it. He's the band. He's Phil Steel at Phil Steel 042. I'm at Kyle Shass at trip heard the lock doctor it's been great uh find us on youtube the varsity network channel of course wherever you podcast college sports now apple podcast spotify all that jazz we'll be back next week with a vengeance uh better than ever week eight coming up next enjoy week seven though bet smarter not harder be more like phil with the phil Steele show and phil thanks everyone